Well, good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar, and uh, I'm going to continue on the lines of the uh, introduction to cardiovascular and uh, clotting agents. This is going to be part two in a series of videos, and uh, just pick up where we left off. We just finished talking about the about cardiac conduction, um, about the um, action potential, and the polarization uh, specifically and uh, what uh, cations and anions move where. Specifically, we talked about the cations, sodium, uh, potassium, and uh, to some extent, calcium. Uh, so what we can now do is, uh, from that, that, that basic understanding that we've developed, is uh, there is actually a classification system uh, that we can classify different cardio cardiac agents into, known as the von Williams classification. And here's just a table that I um, have shamelessly stolen from Wikipedia, uh, but it is it is an accurate table, and it kind of uh, is a kind of an, an interesting way of looking at the medications. So the way that this works is it starts at class one, and you can see at the the top here, um, I start at one A, I go down to one B and one C. Uh, collectively, all of the class one agents. All of the class 1 agents um, block sodium channels. Um, some of them block fast sodium channels, and some of them block um, intermediate or slow sodium channels. Um, so all of your type class 1 agents block sodium channels, and we'll talk about them in a little more detail here in a bit. Uh, your class 2 agents, um, instead of blocking an ion channel, these actually block an adrenergic receptor, specifically um, a beta receptors. It may be a beta 1 or a beta 2 receptor. Um, some of these, what we call beta blockers, your type 2 agents, um, are non-selective in that they, they um, block all beta receptors. And other types of beta blockers are more selective in that they only block the beta-1 receptors, and we'll talk about why we need to make that uh, differentiation when talking about beta blockers, and it actually has um, some respiratory implications. Your class 3 agents are actually very compl complicated types of agents. Um, we formally say that they are potassium channel blockers, However, um, it is a much more complicated for the most part, uh, particularly the the one agent that is used from this class um, on a fairly frequent basis, and that is um, amiodarone. And we'll talk about uh, those in just a little bit here. And then I have my class four agents, which are known as my calcium channel blockers, and these block uh, calcium channels. Um, and uh, they, of course, can do a couple of different things. Not only can they, they have um, negative chronotropic um, effects, but um, for muscles to contract, you need to have calcium. And if I block calcium, um, not only do I you know, have a, a, a decrease of um, the, the chronotropy in the heart and to some extent inotropy, um, I can prevent uh, smooth muscles from contracting in other parts of the body with calcium channel blockers, specifically in blood vessels, and so I can actually cause a decrease or reduction in blood pressure with these medications. And then the fifth and final class is kind of a, um, a miscellaneous or undetermined class, um, and this c contains the two medications, adenosine and digoxin, and, of course, I talked a little bit about the, the role of digoxin a little later on, and we'll talk about adenosine here in a little bit. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to compare and contrast the, class, the different class 1 agents and the class 3 agents. Um, so if you look here, the black line is the normal action potential, the normal depolarization, repolarization. If you remember, the flat area is... Um, phase 4, where I have a resting membrane potential of about a negative 100 millivolts. This straight line here is phase 0, where I have a rapid influx of sodium into the cell as the cell depolarizes. I then have a plateau. During this plateau phase, I start to repolarize, and calcium right here in phase 2 begins to move in 
from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and cause actual contraction. And then potassium is pumped back into the cell, sodium pumped back out, and I have repolarization and I have a reestablishment uh, of the resting uh, potential. Now, the little red dotted line, however, is how an agent from that category affects this action potential. So, if you look here, my class 1A agent, um, I have a, a little bit, some effects here on the, uh, the phase 1, and we would expect that simply because I'm blocking certain sodium channels. But if you look here, um, I have a rather pronounced effect over here on um, my phase two and, and particularly phase three um, repolarization. And it actually prolongs this action potential a little bit. Um, looking at my class 1B agents, uh, very little effect on uh, the, the phase 1 for the most part, phase 2, and a little bit of, uh, obviously I have some effects on phase 2 and 3, um, and I actually see a slight shortening of that. Um, my class C, um, you can see very pronounced um, effects here on uh, phase 1, and uh, fairly minimal effects on phase two and phase three. And um, of course, uh, again, you know, we're talking sodium channels. And then I have my class three agents, the potassium channel blockers. And as you'd expect, not a whole lot of, of effects on the phase um, zero, one, um, and two. And I have some effects on, in phase three and actually it I prolong um, the time it takes to repolarize because I'm blocking potassium channels and it's taking potassium a little longer to uh, go into the cell. Um, so did you notice anything particularly interesting about the 1A and the 3 agents? So this is 1A here and 3. Well, what we notice is that the action potential is prolonged here and here. I have a prolongation of the action potential and that will become um, that effect is uh, highly noteworthy, and we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. <clears throat> okay, so um, as you guys are aware that are in my pharmacology class, I have blue light specials. Um, so the medications that I want you to focus in on, and you'll be doing drug cards on these as well, are um, the med one of the medications from the class 1B, that's lidocaine. Um, a medication from your class 2, um, your beta blockers, propranolol, esmolol, metoprolol, and otenolol. The class 3 agent known as amiodarone. The two class 4 agents, verapamil and diltiazam, and then adenosine and digoxin um, from the uh, class, <clears throat> excuse me, from the class 5 agents. Okay, so let's go ahead and just focus in on some of these agents real quick. Um, so we'll just kind of start at the top here of my class 1B agents um, under lidocaine. And actually, I, I took a little picture of lidocaine. Obviously, that's expired a while ago, but we, we take expired medications um, and get rid of the meds and then fill the syringes with either water or normal saline and then use those uh, for training in the EMS department. Um, but lidocaine is uh, known as a sodium channel blocker. It doesn't really affect a repolarization a whole lot. It does not prolong the action potential. Um, and through blocking of uh, certain sodium channels, I can, in theory, perhaps prevent a ventricular ectopy or um, heart, rate or heart rhythm irregularities. I know you guys have not covered um, you, you have not covered um, cardiac dysrhythmias yet, and, and you won't until uh, it's going to be two or three more semesters before you get to cover uh, dysrhythmias. Uh, so this really won't make a whole lot of sense at this point. You have taken BLS, and you've heard of something called a ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. This is one of the medications that can potentially be used to treat life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmias. Um, it has fallen out of favor in recent years, and what we uh, often are now using 
instead of lidocaine um, is the medication amiodarone. Amiodarone, of course, is a potassium channel blocker. It does prolong the QT interval. Amiodarone can treat a variety of different problems, including ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, um, atrial fibrillation, rapid heart rhythms, uh, something called supraventricular tachycardia, if there's atrial fibrillation associated with it. Um, so it has a wide uh, variety of, of uses. However, because amiodarone and a, a couple of other agents prolong the QT interval, they uh, make the patient prone to developing a very um, specific dysrhythmia that is potentially lethal and in some cases difficult to treat. And any medication, this is definitely blue light special, any medication that prolongs the, the, the action potential, particularly an interval known as the QT interval, something that you will study a little later on in your classes, anything that prolongs the QT interval that is from the Q wave to the T wave on the ECG, will make your patient prone to developing this dysrhythmia. And this dysrhythmia is known as uh, torsade de pointe. It literally means twisting about the points. and is a very special kind of what we call a polymorphic. It has a different morphology, um, ventricular tachycardia. Uh, again, that's something that we're going to study later on in, in class. So I don't want to focus too much on that, but just know that any of the medications, uh, particularly your, your class 1A and your class 3 agents, um, will prolong the QT interval and make the patient more prone to developing torsade de pointe, or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, really the only agent that you see used a whole lot, well not even a whole lot, but a little bit from the class 1A is procainamide, but it's so rarely used in this area um, anymore that I'm really not requiring that you guys do medication cards and study it extensively like these other medications. Um, okay, I should say that lidocaine is, if you are f familiar with going to the dentist, um, and most people would say, oh yeah, they give you Novocaine to numb you up. Um, uh, and that's actually not the case anymore. Um, we used to but there are a fair number of allergies to the Novocaine, but Novocaine is very similar to lidocaine. It is a, is a um, sodium channel blocker. Uh, Novocaine has a slightly different uh, chemistry. I believe that it uh, has a significant ester bond in its molecular structure, whereas lidocaine has an, an amide bond or um, a nitrogen uh, bond in it. Um, and allergies to lidocaine are a lot less, but um, lidocaine does have a, a quote-unquote numbing effect. Um, and again, because not only does it work on the heart, um, but it works uh, on any kind of conductive tissue such as neurons. And if sodium channels um, are inhibited in neurons, um, of course, uh, a neuron will be unable to depolarize um, or, or it'll have a harder time depolarizing. And uh, in that case, you know, that area where that neuron can't depolarize, it cannot send information to the brain. Therefore, the brain's not aware of pain that is occurring. Um, so, of course, lidocaine has some other uses as well. Some people will say that lidocaine, quote-unquote, numbs the heart. Um, I take issue with this kind of description of lidocaine. Um, because that assumes that the heart tissue itself feels a whole lot of pain. And in reality, the heart does not feel a whole lot of pain. It doesn't have a lot of pain receptors in it. And when you have pain, like you're having a heart attack, um, that pain comes from the stimulation of tissue around the heart that has pain receptors. There's inflammatory changes and there are um, chemicals and substances being released by the um, ischemic and dying um, heart cells or myocardial cells that activate pain receptors in the tissue surrounding the heart. Um, so I do not um, like using that a description that lidocaine quote-unquote numbs the heart um, because it doesn't really. Now the, the effect is very similar to numbing uh, nerves and things like that where you are um, you are inhibiting or you are blocking sodium channels. That's really the significant physiology of this medication. Uh, moving down to the class 2, the beta blockers, these have 
uh, significant uh, numbers of uses. They can decrease the heart rate. They can be used to decrease blood pressure. They can be used to treat certain um, we call tachydysrhythmias or fast rhythms. Um, you have a propranolol, esmolol, metoprolol, and atenolol. Um, and like I said before, these uh, medications can either be selective or non-selective. And a non-selective medication, a good example, is a medication like propranolol. If I give somebody propranolol, it will attach to all beta receptors. Beta 1 and beta 2 are of particular importance to us. Now, if I have somebody, let's say that they have um, uh, asthma or some other form of COPD and they're very sensitive, um, if I block the beta-2 receptors in their lungs with a non-selective beta blocker and they end up having bronchospasm and I use a beta agonist such as albuterol or leva albuterol to treat that, um, that patient may be much harder to treat because their beta receptors are already blocked. So patients that have these kinds of respiratory disorders, um, you want to be very careful about giving them non-selective beta blockers. And in fact, uh, what I would recommend is that you consider selective or cardioselective beta blockers. Um, there's esmolol, which is very specific to beta-1 receptors, but esmolol is an infusion, um, and these patients typically don't go home on esmolol infusions. Uh, metoprolol and atenolol are very common uh, medications. Uh, metoprolol, uh, for example, is very common in this area. The trade name of toprolol XL, or extended um, release, um, is a very common home medication that we find pe patients on. Um, metoprolol, tenolol, and esmolol are more cardioselective and probably safer in patients with uh, COPD um, that uh, require treatment. Uh, we've talked a little bit about am amiodarone. Amiodarone, of course, is uh, used for life-threatening dys dysrhythmias. Um, I should say the doses for lidocaine and amiodarone, since they are used maybe a little more frequently in emergencies, lidocaine is 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram um, IV push, followed by an infusion at 2 to 4 milligrams per minute. Um, amiodarone is a bit more complicated. If the patient is in cardiac arrest, they don't have a heartbeat, we will give 300 milligrams slow IV push. If they do have a heart, heart uh, beat or they have a pulse, we will administer 150 milligrams IV push. After that, we start a drip. Um, mixing it is a bit more complicated, um, but really what we do is we start an infusion at one milligram per minute for um, several hours and then change that infusion to, I believe, half a milligram per minute. Um, and this is all done over a 24-hour time period. Again, we'll talk about these medications in more detail um, later on in ACLS and PALS. Uh, your calcium channel blockers, we talked about them. Verapamil, dil diltiazem or cartazem is really the one that we run into quite a bit. It's uh, diltiazem can come in oral form or IV form. Um, it's not uncommon to see it given IV in the hospital, particularly the ICU, to treat tachydysrhythmias. Um, it's given as a weight-based bolus and then followed up by an infusion. Um, adenosine is an interesting medication. Adenosine blocks the AV node. So if somebody has a very rapid heart rhythm and I administer adenosine to them, um, <clears throat> it actually blocks conduction through the AV node and you actually may see... Um, uh, a high-grade heart block or even a systole for several seconds and then hopefully the normal pacemakers will then kick back in and I'll go back into a normal rhythm. It's very dramatic to see adenosine used for the first time and we talked about digoxin a little earlier in the first lecture.